of artificial intelligence is trying to build computer programs that behave intelligently. So that could be trying to identify faces or translating languages or uh, making movie recommendations. But machine learning is a specific type of artificial intelligence which is about trying to get a computer to learn automatically. And that's the kind of AI that we focus on. We apply machine learning to try to get a computer to learn how to do long-term investing in the stock market. High-frequency trading firms are generally focused on trading very fast, as the name suggests. And the idea is that if you trade before someone else, you're, able, you're likely to make more money than they will. Um, we focus on the complete opposite end of the time scale. We're doing very long-term investing. And so it's, it's just a fundamentally very different approach. Uh, we're trying to use this idea that computers can learn automatically from data to try to make decisions and try to discover ways to profit Whereas generally, high-frequency firms and most other quantitative firms are implementing specific theories that they have of how to make money rather than trying to get a computer to learn it. I think there's a huge number of applications for machine learning that have been sprouting up all over the place. Um, we have companies like Google using it. when they're, uh, uh, We've got companies using it to serve advertisements to figure out what ad you're most likely to click on uh, or what product you're most likely to buy. Uh, we also see it, it's now in cameras to try to detect when someone smiles so that you can snap your photo at just the right time. So we're just seeing an enormous proliferation of these applications and I expect them to grow over time as the methods get better and better and as more data is available. When dealing with unpredictable things, you model them using probability theory, which is a whole set of mathematical tools designed to deal with uncertainty. Um, so you can never reduce things to total certainty, but what you can do is by uh, the, having access to factors relevant to the thing you're trying to predict, you can reduce the uncertainty. Um, and so when you're applying these methods to the stock market, for example, you're able to uh, leverage information that you know should be relevant to the thing you're trying to predict. And you won't be able to be perfect in your prediction, but hopefully you'll have some level of accuracy. I think that there's a common misconception that people have that uh, if you're a human, you're taking into account all the information, and if you're a computer, a computer doing trading, you don't. But in fact, humans don't take into account all the information either. Uh, if you're a value investor, you don't look at technical uh, charting information. If you're a trader, you probably don't look at the information the value investors look at. And plus, because of limited time, nobody can look at all the information. There's just too much information out there. So every investor faces the same problem, that there's some information that they're not going to be able to take into account. It's just, it's a bit magnified when you're dealing with computer investing or computer trading because there's some types of information that are just sort of very hard for a computer to process. So, but this is actually a problem that every investor faces. Um, the way that we approach this is we try to model things that we don't know as essentially sources of uncertainty, sources of noise. And by holding a diversified portfolio, and by relying not just on one method of prediction, but basically on multiple styles of, of making money, you try to reduce the chance that an unpredictable event impacts you really poorly. One of my business partners, Alexander Fleiss, he had been investing from a very early age and actually done very well with his investments and had this idea of starting a company. I, I was studying math at the time and I knew uh, about investing, but um, I hadn't at that point thought a lot about applying mathematics to investing. And basically when he came to me and started talking about uh, basically teaming up on, and creating a fund, I started thinking seriously about it and I realized not only are there a huge number of applications of mathematics investing, but in particular, this idea of getting a computer to learn on its own could be really nice in this area because often we don't fully understand the processes that we're dealing with and we might actually want a computer to help us understand these processes, help us figure out ways to make money, for example, that we don't ourselves haven't yet figured out. One, one uh, I think, aspect of finance that can uh, sometimes be misused is this notion of the beta of a stock. Uh, the beta of a stock is supposed to measure on average, how much a stock tends to go up when the market goes up a certain amount. And although it's useful and has its time and its place to be used, 
I think a lot of people don't realize that in many cases, the betas don't actually exist in a meaningful sense. They'll try to apply it, for example, to smaller companies that move erratically. And if you actually study these betas, you realize that they have no predictive power. Um, this, this is a, a very, I mean, it's a very commonly used technique. It's taught at business schools. It's part of the fundamental core of the CAPM model of pricing. And yet, in, for many companies, it's just not a meaningful concept. It doesn't actually have predictive power. I think a lot of people don't realize that. There's, there's value in teaching models that, that do have some predictive power, even if they don't work all the time. It's just really important to also teach when they might fail or what their drawbacks might be. And I think what can happen is that people end up relying on these techniques without fully understanding them. And part of that is a mathematical challenge that many people, they don't understand the underlying mathematical methods that the technique relies on, and, and that means that in part they don't necessarily understand its limitations. I think that there are a number of misconceptions that are, are commonly held. Um, I think that among the sort of cream of the crop uh, investors, I think that they tend to not fall into these misconceptions as much as you'd expect. I don't think that, that uh, we're at that point in the state of the knowledge that I would feel comfortable relying or, or you know, trusting people to design AIs to try to regulate the market. Um, it's possible that, that it could be something that could happen one day, but I think there's still a lot of research to be done on how to apply AI in cases like finance where the system is constantly shifting, um, where what, you, what occurs this year may be quite unique and never have occurred before in historical data. And that's a, that's a particularly challenging area for applying machine learning and one of the reasons why I think it's a really interesting application area.